Welcome to the All of Christ for All of Life podcast, where we equip men and women to be faithful in every aspect of life. This week, you'll hear Rebecca Merkel's talk, Building Beauty, from our audio collection titled, Glory Makers. All right. Thanks for coming. I'm glad I get the after lunch slot so you can all schnooze while I talk. Um, That's fine. Um, All right, so I'm talking about beauty and building beauty and what that has to do with culture making. So the conference is on making um, lots of things. And um, so this is just how does beauty affect culture and what is our role in contributing to that? I think it's a really important topic, honestly, because I think beauty is something that Christian women especially can get really spooled up about and not know what our relationship is to it. Um, and are we supposed to be scared of beauty? Are we supposed to feel guilty about beauty in, you know, just in general? So I, we should stop probably and figure out beauty. Am I talking about personal beauty or beauty in the home or just beauty in general? And I guess the answer is yes, all of those things. Um, so why do Christian women get all tangled up about it? And I think um, depending on your personality, you'll probably fall into one camp or the other, but I think um, it's easy for us to feel guilty. Like, you know, if you care about beauty, then that means you're being worldly and, you know, we're supposed to be heavenly minded and not have our treasure on earth and that kind of stuff. So it's easy to feel bad if you, you know, want things to be beautiful, etc. Um, some people, I mean, I'm, I doubt that that's probably as much the crowd I'm talking to, but you never know. Um, there's sort of two camps on this. Some people are very motivated by beauty in lots of ways, you know, affected by it. Um, you know, if you, there's some people that can't have a good day if the house is a mess, you know, that kind of stuff. It just really affects your outlook and, and everything. You're just really impacted by beauty in lots of ways or driven by it. Um, other people are scared of it. And they feel like, um, you know, stay away from that. That's going to be worldly, and, and that will make me feel bad. Um, so I think there's sort of the two ditches, as my dad always says. There's a ditch on both sides of the road. There's the people who just rush into it, and they never stop to think about what the Bible has to say about it. And then there's other people who say, stay away from that. It's not Christian. Um, so obviously, um, there's a couple ways that... Christians can go. And I think that especially in our circles, it's easy to brush off people who are concerned about it. They see the dangers of running that direction. Um, You know, if people start quoting, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, it's easy to blow that off as, oh, that's Gnostic. You're just being a Platonist. Never mind about that. I'm going to go ahead and do what I want to do. So in our particular circles, Gnostic is a bad word, you know, and Platonist is a bad word, and we know that, so it's easy to just brush off any, um, you know, warnings as, oh, you're just being a Gnostic. Um, So there's the group that likes to shop and likes to decorate and likes to, you know, likes clothes and likes to get dressed up and that kind of thing. There's that personality. And then there's the kind of person that's like, no, I'm plain, I'm simple, I'm practical, I don't care about that as long as everything is running well, or I'm doing more important things. I can't be bothered with fixing my hair um, because I'm doing more important things. We lived in Oxford for a while, and it was very funny because there's this sort of, in the academic world there in Oxford, if you're, you you should be like really personally very schlumpy because that means you're quite smart because you can't be bothered, you know, with details, like if your shirt's all the way tucked in. Um, so So there's this kind of, Um, you know, I live up here in the smart realm. I can't be bothered. And and so it's really funny how totally hectic some of these people's houses were. I mean, just piles and heaps of stuff everywhere. And yeah, they were brilliant, but it was like everything was a mess around them. But that was almost a point of pride, right? I don't, I'm not, um, you know, like you plebeian people. Um, I live up here with the academics. Um, So it's easy for the one group to tell the other group, you're just being worldly. And it's easy for the, that one to tell the other one, you know, you're being Gnostic. So obviously, the, the important thing is, well, what does the Bible say about it? What are we supposed to think we're Christian women? So obviously, we should care what the Bible has to say about this. And interestingly enough, it has things to say. 
Um, I think the big one, obviously, well, there's the whole thing about don't let your beauty be merely outward. And of course, in that one, it's merely outward. Don't let it just be that. Don't wash just the outside of the cup. We know that true beauty is the gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Um, and then in Proverbs 31, where it says, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, right? And that's the one that's very, it's quoted very quickly by the team that thinks it's worldly to care about beauty is, beauty is vain. We all know Solomon said beauty is vain. Um, and so if you hear that verse and you think, well, that's a bit Gnostic, Solomon, you know, then you might have a problem. <laughs> I did, I had a friend one time and it was totally awesome. She was having a, like a theological question. And so I said, well, you know, right here in Romans, let's read that verse. And she looked at it and she goes, oh, I don't care for that at all. And I was like, well, that's cool. <laughs> it's like, well, at least it has a virtue of honesty, right? It's like, I just don't like that, what the Bible is saying. And some people, I think we just brush it off like, oh, yeah, beauty is vain, whatever. If you're the kind of person that cares about it, it's like, don't talk to me about that. I, I have it all figured out. Um, so, yeah, if you think Solomon might have been Gnostic, then you should probably rethink um, but if you hear that verse and you think, right, beauty is vain, and you think that means beauty is bad, then you need to probably rethink as well. Um, so when we hear beauty is vain, what does that mean? I mean, obviously God put it in there for some reason. We're supposed to see beauty as being vain, at least in some sense. So what does vain mean? And does that mean bad or evil or we shouldn't care about it? And actually, you know, there's a whole book of the Bible about vanity, and that's Ecclesiastes, interestingly, by the same guy who said beauty is vain. And, um, you know, um, my dad preached a series of sermons a long time ago, I don't know, 15 years ago or something, about uh, just through Ecclesiastes, and it was just terrific. So if you haven't heard those sermons, they're totally worth a listen. Um, and I think he turned them into a book, Joy at the End of the Tether, but um, just vanity and grasping after the wind. And if you think about that phrase that just gets used over and over in Ecclesiastes, it's all vanity and grasping after the wind. And so does that mean, so it's all bad, just throw in the towel, don't care about anything? Or, you know, what's he saying when he tells us it's, it's vanity, it's grasping after the wind? Um, and I think that beauty is actually a lot like that. If you, if you think about somebody who's trying to grasp the wind, it's frustrating, obviously, because you're never going to get it. You can't grab hold of the wind. And, and if you could, then the second you succeeded, you would have failed because it's not the wind anymore, right? As soon as you grab onto it and get it, you know, into a little bottle or something, well, it's not wind anymore. You've just lost the very thing that you were trying to get. And beauty is very similar to that, because if you just think about how frustrating it can be, like you work and work and work to get whatever, the remodel on the house done, and you get it, and it's just pristine and beautiful, and then it gets dusty and greasy, and people ding the paint, and it starts falling apart. You can't just get it, and then it's done, and there it is. It's beautiful, and it's finished. It always fades. It always breaks. Something always goes wrong, right? You spend all this money on a brand new haircut, and what happens? It gets greasy. So, you know, it's like you can't just get it and then there it is. It's just done. Step back. Now I have it. So if you're, if you're trying to attain just beauty for beauty's sake, you're going to be disappointed, just like grasping for the wind. It's just you, you can't get it. You get the house all cleaned up and it looks just fabulously cute. And then the kids all come in and their socks go everywhere. And papers come out of the backpacks and it's all just like blah again. Um, so it's just the constant, I mean, beauty in a lot of ways, it is vain. It's like you just can't, you can't get it and hold on to it. It's like you're not going to be 18 and thin and beautiful forever, right? <laughs> it's like you can have beautiful body, beautiful face, and you'll get old. That's what happens. I mean, you can't ever just get it and hang on to it. So if you're the kind of person that's motivated by beauty in a lot of ways, it can be really frustrating if it's just this, it feels like you're constantly trying and, and just never grabbing onto it. It's always just eluding you somehow. So um, I think in terms of just the Ecclesiastes thing, it is, it's just vanity and grasping for the wind. So I think when he says charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, it's like that. It's just gone in a second. And so what's our relationship supposed to be 
to beauty. So I don't think it means it's evil in itself, right? It just it means that it, if you make it an end in itself, it, it implodes on itself and you can never get it. And if you think about um, people who do try to grab onto to it and hold on to beauty, it always ends up so hideous, you know? Um, so you have the beautiful centerpiece that wilts. Um, so solve that, just make it all plastic. Um, and then it just gets like dusty, you know, dusty plastic is like you try and solve the problem and it just is like, oh, or somebody who can't handle the dirt on the carpet. So we're just going to lay down the plastic mat on top. You know, it's just never, you don't achieve beauty by trying to solve it in that way. Um, yeah. So you remodel your house, it gets dusty. You get the new haircut, it gets greasy. You make a beautiful dinner, people eat it. It's just, <laughs> and then it's just a pile of dirty dishes. Um, yeah, so um, it's just this constant, um, and, and of course women who try and hang on to that 18 year old look, there's nothing sadder. Have you ever noticed this? Mom's weekend is a big moment to notice. Rachel's talk about reading the story, just go out for a cruise on Mom's weekend here in Moscow when it's like all the college moms come to town. It's a real eye-opener um, because you've got all the like sorority girls and their mothers who are trying to look like they blend in with the sorority girls and we call them the Dale Donuts because it's like... <laughs> It's like, yeah, it was, it was, it's just not good. You know, it's like over tanned, over bleached, over, you know, nipped and tucked and everything else. And they end up looking like a really bizarre kind of piece of jerky. And it doesn't, I mean, seriously, you know what I'm talking about. Like that really made up and really just weirdly, and, and it's, nobody's fooled into thinking that they're one of the sophomores. You know, it's really, and, and oddly enough, they end up looking so much worse than if they just tried to look their age, right? And so, so it's like sometimes women can look just used up and old by the time they're 28, you know? It's like you don't have to actually look so hideous by now. But um, it's that trying to just grab onto it and then I won't let go. I'm just going to have this look forever and it's just it goes off so quickly um yeah so they become themselves the dusty fake grape centerpiece um <laughs> you know what i'm saying i mean it's so gross um but and yeah it's okay so you have to forgive me for a lit illustration. It happens during the school year since I'm teaching lit at Logos. My husband has to put up with me constantly saying, well, that's a lot like the Iliad. In the, <laughs> in the summertime, I don't do that. But then all of a sudden, it's the school year, and now I have things that I, parallels I'm drawing. There's this truly wicked, awful story in Ovid. Like all of the stories in Ovid, it's wicked, awful. And it's this king. And for reasons I can't quite remember, but I will in third quarter he um, gets possessed by famine, by the god, uh, just the goddess fam, like famine itself personified possesses him. And so he just starts eating, you know, everything. And nothing will fill him up. He's just this like black hole and he just keeps eating and eating and eating and he never feels satisfied. And so of course in the end he starts selling his daughter or something to try and make more money to buy more food. It goes really dark. Then, in the end, he just devours himself because there's no food left. He's, he's just bankrupted his kingdom with eating, and he just eats himself, and it's just horrific. But in a lot of ways, that's really the picture of, of like women who can't let go of their beauty. You know, they end up destroying the very thing that they're idolizing, so it's like they want to look young and beautiful forever, so ironically, they just look like old hags, yeah, by the time they're 28. It's just this, it's this horrific, like, turning on yourself and devouring yourself in this, in this bizarre way. And I think that that can happen very easily if your focus goes wrong. If you start looking, um, you just want beauty for beauty's sake or, or whatever. Start looking to the wrong thing. Um, I do think that, um, obviously, we're Christians. We know that ultimate beauty and ultimate truth and holiness, they all go together, right? Truth and goodness and beauty. So we know in one sense that beauty um, is 
an attribute of righteousness and so forth. But, but there's so many ways it can go wrong, right? So we get kind of scared of it and aren't sure where to put it and we don't really know. Um, and I think rebellion, in a lot of ways, there's the, per there's the person that just ends up idolizing beauty and then it just goes nasty and sour. Um, but then, of course, if you just look around, um, other people just overtly reject beauty. And so a lot of just, just poor, like, sad people who are lost and hate God, and so that's where they go, is they go straight into ugly, and they just try to embrace ugliness because that's their way of showing that they're rebelling against God and truth and everything else. Um, and so, I don't know, you're probably not all up on Lady Gaga. Neither am I. However, um, what's that song she has about, I want your ugly, I want your disease? I mean, there's people who just like, that's what I want. I'm going to just embrace ugly because I hate God, and so I'm going to go there. And then there's people who, I'm, I want beauty. I just, I want beauty. And then they end up just, ugh, you know, because they, they grab the thing and then it implodes and, and it's all, and, and both, interestingly, end in ugliness, right? You've got the person that idolizes, idolizes beauty and it ends in ugliness. And the person that just says, never mind, I'm just going to go straight to ugly, skipping the whole beauty thing entirely. Um, so, again, I think the grasping after beauty can be like grasping after the wind. It's just, it's the thing you can't get a hold of. So what are you supposed to do with it then? If you can't get it, if you can't attain it, if you can never hold on to it, then what, what are you supposed to do with it? And I think if you think about the wind, you can't grab a hold of it. You can't keep it on the shelf. What are you supposed to do with the wind? Well, if you're a ship, you can sail with the wind. You can use the wind. It can take you somewhere. It can accomplish something. But if you try and just, I'm just going to grab onto it and then just keep it in a tidy spot, I mean, you're going to be disappointed and frustrated. And so I think beauty is the same way, where it's like if you try and just grab it and hold onto it for the sake of itself, you, you, you can never get it. But it's like the wind. It can, it can take you somewhere if you have the right relationship to it. Um, so if you think, just run with the metaphor, you're a ship and you're trying to get somewhere and you're going to use the wind. Um, and beauty is a, a similar thing. But of course, if you, if you tend to be the kind of person that's like, stay away from the worldliness, you're going to say, if you get in the ship and start sailing, you're going to bonk into something. And it's true. If you just hop in a ship and just go wherever the wind takes you, probably sooner than later you will crash on something or go off the waterfall or run into the cliff or get smashed on the rocks or capsize. So if you just run headlong with whatever you happen to want to do, you're going to run into trouble probably sooner than later. In the same way, if you go in without any wisdom and you just think, Yahoo, I'm going to gallop off and do whatever I want, then you'll end up in trouble. But also, if you're, kind of the, if you're the kind of person that sees that and says, so I'm taking my sails down, folding them up, and sitting on them, and we're going to stay tied up to the dock so as to not get into trouble, you're never going to go anywhere, right? So there's, um, you have to have wisdom in knowing where you're going and how you're going to negotiate this and how are you going to navigate and where are we steering and which direction are we trying to go. Um, so there's more to it than just saying, beauty is great. We're all going to run for it because there are warnings in Scripture about it. If you make it an idol, if you want it for itself, you're going to lose it um, and wreck yourself, wreck your family um, in the meantime. So um, if we go with the metaphor of the ship, where are we trying to go, right? We're going to say, all right, great. Beauty is going to help us go somewhere. Where are we trying to get? Obviously, we're, it should be Christ. The goal should be Christ and heaven, um, ultimately. But we're going towards Christ. We should be going closer to him, more Christ-likeness. That should be the goal. That's what we should be aimed towards, and not just running wherever we happen to feel like going. Um, beauty is powerful for a lot of reasons, but one is it touches that thing in us that reason and logic can't, right? It, it touches desire. Um, basically, if you think of a guy maybe who is tangled up with some girl that's 
bad news. And you're to sit him down and you're going to tell him all the reasons why she is a bad idea for you. And here's all the reasons. He could sit there and nod and be like, yeah, you're right. You're totally right. He could go check, 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 check. But I want her anyways. Because desire is something that can't always be, you can't argue somebody out of something that they want. Because, well, they want it. And there's no arguing with that, right? And beauty somehow touches that part in us where it's like, um, you know, it could be, and like, I'm just sort of talking broadly beauty in general, but I just mean like personal beauty, beauty in art or in the home or, or whatever. It touches that part in us that you can't really reach with other things. You can't reach it with logic. Random personal example that you'll probably all think, oh my word, she's so weird. So true confessions right now. When I was probably like senior in high school, maybe, probably a senior, is when dad became paid a Baptist. I was like, oh my heavens, we are becoming Catholic. We are all going over to the Pope. And <laughs> I was just like, this is dreadful. So we're, you know, like he's walking us through it and, and we're arguing at dinner and all this stuff. And I was just like, pancake faced icons, here we come, because this is horrible. And <laughs> it was really bad. I was just like, that's it. We're, yeah, we're crossing the Tiber. Here we go. And um, so he's walking me through all of the, you know, theological reasons. And then I would go to school and totally have it out with my friends. And, and at school, I would be a paid a Baptist. And then at home, I'd come home and be a Baptist, you know. Because at school, like, there was no way, <laughs> there was no way I was going to argue, like, against my dad in front of my friends. So I would go and, you know, like, I'd be very paid about this. Then I'd go home and be saying all the things my friends were saying to dad. And, and so it was like, yeah, he'd walk me through all of it, but it was still like, oh, it just feels really dark. And, and then this is so, so funny, but watching a music video, and I don't even know what the song was or who it was. I have no memory of it, but there was this moment in the music video that it was a baby being baptized out in the river. And I was like, oh, I could do that. I could get behind that. Because it was just this sort of, <laughs> it was like, oh, it's not with a hideous icon over the top. But it was, um, it was just this like really beautiful image that all of a sudden I was like, ah, click. Okay, I can get behind this now, which is really terrible. I did have reasons, you know, like I'd, I'd walk through all the reasons, but then it was just like, oh, it's just like Catholic and dark and ugly and just, bleh. and then, and then it was like, there was a picture and I was like, okay, I can do that. I can get behind that. So it's like beauty can, you know, it's like it can touch you in some place that you can't get to otherwise. Um, so anyway, it's powerful. It can be powerful in all kinds of ways, obviously. And um, it should be taking us to Christ. We should be using it to be going towards him. Um, our job is to be adorning the gospel. Um, obviously, we have the truth. We have the gospel. We should be making it more beautiful. And hopefully, if that is what's happening, nobody's going to look at you and think, worldly, worldly alert. You're adorning the gospel. If you're thinking of it in that way, then um, hopefully everybody's going to see that you're not just going for beauty for beauty's sake. Um, so we should be making the truth and the gospel beautiful and appealing to those around us. Um, it's a powerful tool. And like I said, it taps into things in people that you can't, you can't get to otherwise. Um, right. So it's powerful. It's a weapon. It carries people in one direction or another, and it can clearly be used. And this is why people get skittish about it. It can be used really wrongly, obviously. Um, you've got the Proverbs 31 woman, and you've got the woman in, is it Proverbs 6? The adulteress who's pulling guys off the straight and narrow and taking them straight to hell. So beauty can be used that way. It can be used to pull people away from Christ. Um, it's dangerous. It can be very dangerous. And so obviously as women, our job is to figure out what we're doing and use it in a way that's not um, rebellious and not wrong. Um, yeah, it is a weapon. And the thing with weapons is you can't say the gun is evil. Well, some people try. But it's what are you going to do with it? 
right? It's, it's, it's the context that makes the difference. So you can't say beauty is wrong. It's just what are you doing with beauty and where are you taking it and who's it for? Are you adorning the gospel or are you adorning yourself and your own reputation? Um, and I think that that's a huge distinction and sometimes it can be very subtle. So if you are, let's say, um, you know, you're really into interior decorating or whatever, you've got a gorgeous home, you love putting time and effort and energy into creating a beautiful home, who is that for? Is it so that everyone will look at you and think, wow, she is so talented and so amazing. Like if that's your motivation, so that people can come in and say, whoa, she's really something, then you're not adorning the gospel at all. You're just adorning yourself and your own reputation, right? You're doing this. This is all about me. It's all focused on me. It's all supposed to point to me. Everybody is going to think, wow, she's just totally incredible. Um, same with obviously your personal beauty. What's it for? What, you know, what is the point of personal beauty or beauty in the home or just beauty at all? Um, who is it for? Is it so that everyone who you walk by is going to be blown away? And if so, then you're, you're focused on the wrong thing. And so if you're using the beauty that way, it's like you're sailing the wrong direction. You're going to run into something, right? Beauty is not okay just in and of itself. It's, it's where are you going with it? What's the point of it? What are you adorning? If you're only adorning yourself, then things have gone off the rails right at the, right the get-go. And we can use lots of things to adorn ourselves, right? There's, I mean, some people are vain about their personal appearance. Some people are vain about their talents. Some people are vain about their skills in interior design or, you know, their entertaining skills or whatever. But if it's all about me, if it's everybody look at me and notice me, then that's your first sign that things have gone wrong. I'm getting a phone call. That's tasteful. I won't take it right now. <laughs> um, so which direction are you pointed with beauty? Now, if you're somebody who's just like, I don't have anything to do with that. I'm doing important stuff, smart stuff, godly stuff, whatever, then I think you could be much more effective if you would stop and put some effort into beauty, right? If you just, just think about that and, and think, this is a tool that maybe I am worried about and so I haven't touched, but it could be something you could learn to use better, right? Um, but if you're the kind of person that's like, yahoo, gung-ho about all of this, then, then there's dangers, right? If you're wielding this tool, it, you can hurt yourself or others. So um, if we think about personal beauty, what's it for? What's the point? Who is it for? Um, for those of you who are married, the answer is probably pretty obvious, right? It's for your husband, right? But also for your children as well. You can use it for others and not always about yourself. Um, now, you should, be, you should be thinking about how you can make your husband look good right? That's your job. You're his crown, his glory. How can you make him look good? Now, that is not the same thing as how can I make all the other guys jealous of my husband? And I think a lot of times those two can get a little confused because women can start thinking, oh, I'm going to make him look really good. Everybody's going to think, wow, look at her. And that's just back to all about me. You're no longer actually thinking about him, even though you sort of have talked yourself into thinking that's what this is. Um, and if you think about mom's talk earlier, it's kindness, domestic kindness. Um, beauty for your husband, that's just kind, right? You're giving something to him. Um, in C.S. Lewis's book, That Hideous Strength, uh, which again, another lit thing. We're going to start reading that next week. Um, but there's a, just a fantastic quote in, in the book, and it's a plot point for, for totally different reasons, but the heroine Jane opens a book and she sees this quote in it, and it's Lewis wrote it. It's not a quote from somebody else, but I think it's, um, to desire the desiring of her own beauty is the vanity of Lilith, but to desire the enjoying of her own beauty is the obedience of Eve. So, um, I don't know, I think Lilith is some weird like Kabbalah legend or something. Anyway, he wasn't saying that Adam had a first wife. But the legend is that there was his first wife and she fell away and stuff. But he's just saying to desire the desiring of your own beauty 
is the vanity of Lilith. To desire the enjoying of your own beauty is the obedience of Eve. And it seems like there's just not too much of a difference between those two, but it's a world of difference. If you just want to be desired, and that's it. If you want to be the thing that tantalizes everyone, that's the vanity of Lilith. To want um, the enjoyment of your beauty for your husband, that's the obedience of Eve. And that's what we should be doing. And I think those two can be confused so easily. And, um, and there's just a whole world of difference there. So who is this for? In personal beauty, it's, yeah, it's for your husband. For those of you who are single still, you know, maybe one day you will have a husband and that will be, um, and there's a more obvious application there, but it's just kindness to your husband to be beautiful. Um, even for your children, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but if you have a mom who does not care about beauty at all, just like, I can't be bothered, I don't do hair, I don't do makeup, I don't do clothes, I'm not interested, end of story. And she's got little girls. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but it can be really bad because those little girls grow up and they are never given a good picture of what it's like to be chaste and beautiful. The only thing they really see is the world's conception of beauty, which is immodest and beautiful. And so if they're, it's like they're going to look at their mom like godly and frumpy or beautiful and worldly. And the thing is, if those are their two options, beauty has a very strong tug on those girls and they just go right over there because it's beautiful and that's like what i was saying before it taps into something in us that arguments can't get at right and logic can't quite get at it's just it's compelling beauty is very compelling so as a kindness to your children sometimes think of your son i mean for girls it's like they're trying to figure out what they're what they're doing but think of your sons too as they're they're going to go out into the world and and pick a wife hopefully they're going to be able to make distinctions between what's godly beauty and what's just vain beauty right so as a kindness to your children you can show them what it looks like to be beautiful modest chaste godly and you can make that compelling and beautiful you're making holiness beautiful for them and that's a very strong argument for kids um, it's just a kindness to your husband as well I mean we've got all these husbands who are trying to be faithful and godly they're trying to be faithful husbands faithful Christians you can make it easier for them or you can make it harder for them and if you just think I don't care about it you know pshaw he can just shift as he can well that's just unkind right it's putting your own interests in front of his and again, if you're, this is, I'm not going to like give you a diagram about how to put on eyeshadow or something. Um, I'm not going to go there. Uh, but it's mostly like if if you know who the audience is, who's the target here? It's not yourself. Hopefully, turn it around. This is for somebody else. Study him. Find out what he likes. Go there. I'm. This is not about um, you know everybody should have this one certain look. Beauty is the the fun thing is God made the world so crazy diverse, right? If you just look at the world, how many kinds of beauty are out there just in nature, right? You've got the crazy jungles and that kind of beauty in the, in the Arctic is a completely different thing. Little tiny, beautiful leaves and nuts and things and then mountains. I mean, it's just, it's so diverse. I'm not going to sit here and tell you there's this one look that Christian women ought to have. But you all have a different audience, right? You all have somebody else that you're trying to give to. And it's not all the same guy. And guys have different tastes. Find out what your husband likes. If he likes it when your hair is in a ponytail, then don't constantly be doing yourself up like you're going to an evening event. This, I mean, seriously, women can do that. It's like, no, that looks terrible. I'm going to dress this way, even when your husband likes something else. Do it for him. Pour yourself out for him. This should be giving to him not it's not all about yourself or like everybody else is going to think that's tech you know just know where who your audience is who you're who you're doing this for bestow on him and again don't have one eye on the crowd don't have it be all about all the other guys so that they'll all think your husband has it really good don't do that one um yeah so be a blessing be a blessing to them and then where are you getting your cues from is another question like who are you learning from in in this whole thing like if you're the person that's always just reading all the pagan 
you know, beauty hints and stuff. Just know you're, you're, <laughs> you're gonna have a lot to sift through there. And Rachel's talking again, read the story. Notice where those women end up. Those are the day old donuts on the fast track. Know where that goes, right? Um, you look at, if you're jealous of the celebrities and how beautiful they are and how beautiful their lives are, you're not reading the story, all right? These are beautiful and totally miserable people. Okay, so we should have something very different in mind than that, not the world's conception of beauty. Um, so read the story. Don't be envious of worldly beauty. Um, we had this friend, this old woman, and she was an artist, and she was very unhappy. But um, she kind of, she was a neighbor of ours, and, and she sort of befriended me for some reason, and she would give me paint. It was great. It was a good relationship. She would give me paint and brushes, really nice ones too. And um, we took her to church one time and she came out and said, I have never seen so many beautiful people. And it's like she just lived in this world that was, it was her and a lot of other unhappy artists and their lives were so ugly. Like these were these people who were, you know, in one sense for them it was all about beauty, but it was just it was just so sad. I mean, her kids wouldn't talk to her. I mean, she was just an unhappy lady. And she came to a place where she just said, I've never seen so many beautiful people in one place. And it's not because, you know, everybody at church just happened to be the A-list celebrity crowd. It's just happy, you know? And people who are giving to somebody else, people who are doing this well, they're pouring themselves out for somebody else, and it's beautiful. It has... Um, yeah, it, ha it can have really profound effects on, on people. And it's not because genetically Christians are so much cuter than other people. <sighs> Although it would be nice, but it's not true. So again, don't be envious of the worldly beauty because um, a lot of times it's just the whited sepulcher, sepulcher thing where it's, you know, nice and clean and pure on the outside and it's just hideous on the inside. So don't be envious of those people. Don't be envious of the king who's devouring himself. Right? If you are, if you think, well, just think, he's never, you know, he's always got everything he wants. It's like, you're in the wrong story. Don't be jealous of those people. The people who are obsessing and devouring themselves and um, destroying everything around them. Don't be jealous of them. Don't get all your beauty cues from them. They're the people who are crashing on the rocks, even as we speak. Um, so in terms of personal beauty, just think, like, who is this for? What am I doing this for? Why should it matter? And think, just kindness, just giving to other people. Now, in the home, like, what's our role as Christian women in, in the home? And Mom's already talked about that this morning, just how it's an important place to be. And it's not important to just be there so that you can sit all day and look at Pinterest or whatever. Um, you should be actively beautifying. Beautifying? Is that a word? Yeah, it is. Yes, good thing. All right. Actively beautifying where you are, okay? You should be just actively thinking, how can I make this a more beautiful place? But again, for whom? Is it for me so that then I can step back and think, ah, now it's perfect? Is it so that everyone else will see me and think, wow, she's so cool at that? Um, or is it so that you can bestow on your family, on your husband and on your children. And there is a way of doing this so that you choke out your children. And I hope that I'm not the only person who has ever done this one. But you know, you get it all cleaned up and it's like, what are you doing? Who threw the throw pillow on the floor? I just got it put nicely there. You know, like you get it all arranged and then somebody comes and sits on the couch and it just messes it right up. And they, yeah, like I said, pull their socks off and do their homework. And it's just, and if you are never letting anybody do that in your house, it's like, I just got this beautiful and this is to the glory of God. Thank you very much. You go somewhere else. <laughs> then, you know, and you can completely choke out your children with that. You can make them feel unwelcome and unwanted and that this sofa is more important than they are or whatever. You should see my sofa. It's hilarious right now. I have nothing to be proud of in my sofa, but it would be nice. Um, so yeah, you can choke out your children. You can chase them away with beauty, right? You can be so obsessed about having the perfect little beautiful home that you're going to chase your kids out from it. And um, I'm sure that more than a few kids have been driven away 
not just from their family, but from the faith. It's like, I want nothing to do with that. Especially when moms, out of total selfishness, put a little, slap a little biblical principle on it. Right? I mean, how much worse could you get than to say, this is about honoring God, so you go somewhere else. Um, you can chase them away. The other thing you can do, though, is, is in a similar thing to what I was saying about personal beauty, you can not care, and you can just have the sloppiest, most low-key home of all time, and nobody gives a rip, and nobody puts in any effort, and you can just let your kids wander away. Right? When they see something else that's beautiful, if you've never given them anything worth sticking around for, you know, you're just leaving them. It's like there's this need that they may have that you're just never going to bother filling. And so you want them to see beauty in the home and you want them to be drawn by it and compelled by it and convinced by it. And you want them to have something there. And then they're not going to go off and be, you know, they're not going to think a frat party is all that. Right? If somebody um, sees that just empty, shallow, like, why would I ever think that's neat? But if they've never sat around a table and had companionship and fellowship at home, then they could think, like, wow, look at that. You know, you want them to be anchored in a way that they're not going to be confused by the shallow little trinkets that the world has to offer. They're not going to be taken in by that because they've seen the true beauty at home. So it's, it's important to give them something there where they're not going to wander off because they've, they've seen what, what it's like at home. Um, so yeah, our homes as Christians should be the most beautiful and the most welcoming um, because we're adorning the truth. Everybody else is just adorning, right? A lot of filth. And we've got the truth to adorn. So it doesn't mean they have to be the most featured in magazines of all, you know, of all homes in the world. Christians should be featured in magazines the most often. I'm not saying that, but, um, <laughs> but they should be noticeably different. They should be more beautiful, more compelling, not more expensive. I don't mean that. But we, we have the truth, and we can make it beautiful and attractive, or we can chase our kids away and, and our husbands away uh, through neglecting it. So... I think the, the key is just realizing that we have the ability to do something really powerful for our families and for our neighbors, or um, we have the power to just turn this whole thing in on itself and become this horrible rat's nest of sin and evil. Um, right, so one thing that um, I told you about the, the artist friend who just thought there were so many beautiful people, there's another woman who was also an artist and also unhappy, um, who was in this community of artists who were all, it was all about them, right? All about their reputation as artists. It was all about um, all of my little portfolio of things I have accomplished. It was not for anybody else. It, they were adorning their own resumes and their own reputations. And that was where she was from. And she came to a group, you know, where we were all doing stuff. And, and it was a lot of moms who were you know, making things for their kids, and, and they would never have considered themselves artists by any stretch. They were just making stuff for their kids, and she was just blown away. Like, she'd never seen people doing anything artistic just, just to give away, right? Just to give to somebody else. And she was like, there's so many artistic people here. And they were people who would never have dreamed of calling themselves artists. They didn't take themselves seriously. They were just moms. They were just doing something fun for their kids and just something silly, you know, to, that their kids would enjoy. And, and it was just a category she did not have because for her, her art was very serious. Very serious indeed because I am an artiste and all of my friends are and we are in a guild and we do things that are very important. Um, but it was never for anybody, right? It was just... It was just all about them. And again, it just, it's just all implodes on itself. It becomes this really unattractive little meeting of bitter women as they're weaving or whatever they were up to. Um, I, way back when I was at NSA, I ended up um, my senior year doing my, my thesis on treatment of women in different cultures. And it was funny, I was nine months pregnant and I had to stand up and give my defense. I was like, yes, no one will listen to a word I say um, on treatment of women. Um, but one book that I remember, and I pulled it out and started looking at it again, it was about Holland during the Reformation. 
And it was just so interesting because it was, Holland was this incredibly reformed country. It's no more, is it very squared away? But during the Reformation, this was a solid group of people. And they were legendary for their women in this place. I mean, everybody was blown away by the women in Holland. And they, and it's really funny just reading the descriptions of other people who went to visit. And they came away saying, like, their houses are so beautiful and clean, and it's amazing, and the women are really pretty, and weirdly very well treated, and they seem to like their husbands. And there's sort of this problem with PDAs in public with the married people, where it was like they seem to get along. It's all very confusing. And um, they were, it was just, nobody quite knew where to put this, because it was like these women who were highly educated and um, really home-centered, and their homes were beautiful, and they were beautiful, and it was like, whoa, what's happening here? And so it's a, it, it's just funny, like reading these sort of, yeah, 16th century descriptions of like strange doings in Holland. Um, and the streets were clean, and it wasn't like a bunch of slop, and you can actually walk on the roads, and, and it's just really, Amazing and beautiful, and it was just the outworking of their faith. Really, it was like they had they'd gotten to the point where they had their Christianity had gotten squared away. The Reformation had happened, and they were pushing it out into the corners. And it was it was just blowing people away because they'd never seen anything like this. They're used to the unhappy homes and the gungy, you know, gungy houses, and nobody getting along, and it's all you know hideous. So, um, in terms of the effect this can have on culture when women are oriented rightly and they're motivated rightly and they're doing it for the right reasons and it's not all about me but it's giving themselves away in this it can have a huge impact on culture in general and then that really draws people you know they think wow what have they got over there it's really beautiful and so i think our orientation should be husbands and children and then neighbors and then the world it's um, so you're not you shouldn't be aiming for the world you know first and foremost just start with what's in front of you do it for the people right in front of you and it can have a huge impact if all the Christian women were doing this for the right reasons I think it would be a massive impact on our culture and it would be such a noticeable difference um, in what we have and what you know the shallow stuff the world has to offer because we have again we have the truth to adorn and like I said, I'm not going to give you a big list of all the things you can go home and do, but I'm, I'm sure that everybody, all of us, could step it up, right? There's places where you can step it up. Just, I know you're doing it already, but just further up and further in, right? There's, but you should never feel like, I've got it now. We've got it good. Because again, if you, as soon as you think you've got it, it's gone, right? You have to keep going. You have to keep working. And it's, you know, the title of the talk is Building Beauty because it's not easy, right? It's so ridiculously hard to keep, you know, to keep things going, to keep things beautiful. It's a ton of work. And, of course, the most hard is the stuff that looks effortless. That's the hardest to achieve. And so it's just that admonition to just keep working and keep doing it and don't get tired and don't, you know, decide to slough off. It's important, and um, it can change the world. So, all right. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the All of Christ for All of Life podcast. That was a message from our audio collection titled Glory Makers. If you'd like to hear the rest of the talks, you can purchase them at canonpress.com.